So let me take on something I've been wanting to for a very long time. On behalf of some very gentle people who are probably the most despised minority in our society. There is something sick in the body politic. When political parties strive to prevent individuals seeking their own well-being, it is deeply troubling when a free citizen seeks professional help for a condition he finds distressing and is blocked by another citizen. In this case, a rigidly ideological politician from receiving such help. Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews said this on February the 3rd. Conversion therapy, the claim to be able to change someone's sexuality or gender identity, destroys lives. And soon, he says, it will be against the law in Victoria because bigoted quackery has no place in this state. End quote. So much ignorance is packed into that statement. Such contempt for suffering and for the evidence of clinical science going back decades that it cannot be left unanswered. Daniel Andrews knows nothing of the people I know who are struggling with unwanted same-sex attraction, usually because it conflicts with their Christian faith. He knows nothing of the clinical psychologists that I know who labour mightily to help such individuals with overwhelmingly beneficial outcomes. He knows nothing of the research spanning almost a century which shows consistent success in helping many such individuals. Daniel Andrews only knows that the zeitgeist is in the mood for stomping on Christians, including gay Christians. These gentle people are perhaps the most despised and marginalised minority in Australia right now. And I will stand with them against this totalitarian assault by the state on their right, on everyone's right, to seek professional help in a time of need. In taking on such a massive topic, I can only hope to convince you of one thing, that there is hope for people who are distressed by unwanted same-sex attraction. There is good evidence that traditional psychological talk therapy is as effective and safe for people who want help with these conditions as it is for people who want help for other complex conditions. Therefore, that therapeutic option must remain open. The state must not ban their liberty by banning access to the therapy that they seek. My friend James Parker was a gay activist for decades before his newfound faith made him want to move away from that world and become able to marry and have children, which he did. He wrote this month about Premier Andrew's ban on help for people like him, saying this, the legal chains being melted and cast in Victorian furnaces could well be shackling individuals right across Australia and beyond before too long, end quote. When Premier Andrews first flagged this proposed ban in 2016, the then health, uh, State Health Minister, Jill Hennessy, said this, quote, we have zero tolerance for any person purporting to be able to convert gay people through medical or therapeutic means. Any attempts to make people feel uncomfortable with their own sexuality is completely unacceptable, end quote. I fully agree with her empty assertions, her splendid straw man argument, because no psychologist I know has ever spoken of converting a gay person's sexuality. No professional would ever seek to make people feel uncomfortable with their sexuality. Such assertions are cheap slander 
from Labor, nothing more. The Greens and the gay activists ramp up the slander with scaremongering about archaic shock therapy that no therapist employs, allegations of harm which are purely anecdotal, of no statistical validity. They use foolish words like gay cure, which no informed person would ever use. And I have never used. Because complex emotional and behavioural conditions are not open to cure, only to modification along a spectrum. Listen to one man, Daniel, describe his experience of authentic counselling for unwanted same-sex attraction. Quote, I wish I could say there is a cure for same-sex attraction, but there is no such thing. Same-sex attraction is something I will struggle with for the rest of my life, but I am now in control of it. It no longer tortures me. And I am attracted to women when I never was before. There are those who will wish to silence me and protest the publication of my story. They will describe reparative therapy as a sham. I can only say, I wish someone had told me about it earlier. End quote. In the land of Victoria where the shadow lies, La Trobe University, which brought you the Safe Schools program, and the Human Rights Law Centre, which was a leading voice in the same-sex marriage debate, have compiled an 80-page opinion piece, a one-sided polemic entitled Preventing Harm, Promoting Justice, Responding to LGBT Conversion Therapy in Australia. It calls for specific legislation to clearly prohibit conversion practices. And it is the document used by Premier Andrews to justify his ban. Now, this piece of politicised research, reports on 15, just 15, disgruntled Australians with bad stories to tell about so-called religious conversion therapy. These 15 people were recruited, we're told, quote, through various LGBT, queer and ex-gay survivor networks, end quote. In other words, through sources which were never going to find any participant who was not disgruntled, who had perhaps happily left the LGBT world behind him. It was never going to find a man like James Parker. Or like Michael Glatzy, a former pin-up boy for gay culture in the US, who said this a few years ago, quote, Coming out of homosexuality has been the most liberating thing I have ever felt. I said before, seven years ago, that it was like coming out of a cave and breathing fresh air. Today, says Michael Glatzy, I can say that being married, it's an entirely an inversion of homosexuality. It doesn't feel as though I've lost any of my sexuality. It's just working in the right alignment. I feel aligned with my mind, my body, my spirit, my sexuality with creation. And that alignment is evidenced through the fact that my relationship with my wife is so real, so natural. End quote. Premier Andrews proposed ban on the right of people like Daniel or James or Michael, to seek help to change. That is a totalitarian act. It is the state trampling on individual liberty, on purely ideological, cultural Marxist, as Steve said, grounds. And the Latrobe survey serves Daniel Andrews' ends. Now, if the authors of that study of 15 disgruntled Australians had wanted to paint a more academic, truer, fuller picture, they could have started by referencing this peer-reviewed study published just last year, titled Effects of Therapy on Religious Men 
who had unwanted same-sex attraction. This much larger survey directly challenges the assertions of harm and ineffectiveness that underlie the Latrobe paper. It surveyed 125 men with active lay religious belief who went through sexual orientation change efforts and found this, quote, most of those who participated in group or professional help had heterosexual shifts in sexual attraction, in sexual identity and behaviour with large statistical effect. Similarly, moderate to marked decreases in suicidality, in depression, substance abuse, and increases in social functioning and self-esteem. Almost all harmful effects were none, too slight. Judged by this survey, these therapies are very beneficial for lay religious people, end quote. I could give the Latrobe authors a dozen other papers to add balance to their report, but this was not a study seeking academic balance. It was a hit job on pastors and doctors and counsellors who dare to defy LGBT orthodoxy. Mind you, mind you, if the Latrobe document was only arguing that untrained church people should not try to fix the complex psychological phenomenon of same-sex attraction, I would agree. I think all of us would be disturbed by certain Christian communities' misguided and coercive approach as described in the Latrobe study, even including alleged exorcisms. I think pastors and priests should limit themselves to teaching the clear moral truth of sexual behaviour and giving prayerful support to their same-sex attracted Christians to live chastely within the body of Christ and leave the deeper exploration of sexual identity to trained clinicians. I've always admired the balance achieved in the Catholic teaching between being faithful to biblical teaching and being sensitive to our fellow Christians who are struggling with same-sex attraction. The Catechism reads this, quote, Basing itself on sacred scripture, the church has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. But individuals do not choose their homosexual condition. For most of them it is a trial. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. End quote. Now, the problem for pastors who want to delegate to trained clinicians is, of course, the Latrobe Report and the Labor government want to prohibit all trained clinicians from providing any such support to anybody, Christian or not. The report calls for clinicians' codes of conduct to, quote, explicitly prohibit conversion practices and ensure that enforcement action is actively pursued, end quote. And so church leaders and their gay parishioners would have nowhere to turn for expert help. The legal chains being forged in Victoria will, as James Parker warned, be shackling individuals and churches across Australia if we do not expose Labor's lies and assert the liberty of the individual patient against this coercion by the state. It's not difficult to demonstrate the truth through clinical evidence and personal testimony that expert therapy can and does indeed help many people to reduce unwanted same-sex attraction and maximise their heterosexual potential. That calling such therapy dangerous and discredited 
as Federal Labor Health Spokesman Catherine King did, is untrue and intemperate. Look at the practice guidelines of the world's leading practitioner in this field, the late Dr. Joseph Nicolosi, with whom I spoke at length in 2015 in America. I asked Joe why he had coined such a clunky term as reparative therapy for this form of talk therapy. He explained that it refers to the repair of emotional wounds through the therapeutic process. Now, as to the principles of this form of counselling, he writes this, important. First, as with all good therapy, reparative therapy never involves coercion. The client has come to the therapist seeking assistance to reduce something distressing to him. And the psychotherapist agrees to share his expertise and his education to help the client meet his own goal. The therapist enters into a collaborative relationship, agreeing to work with the client to reduce his unwanted attractions and explore his heterosexual potential. This collaborative relationship could not, of course, include imposing methods or techniques attempting to cause sexual orientation change, which would anyway be quite impossible. End quote. And on the sensitive question of young people being brought to the counsellor by worried parents, Nicolosi makes clear the only thing that counts, the only thing that works, is the autonomous self-motivation of that young person. Quote, Sometimes the client does not know what he wants, as is often the case with the teenager asked to come into treatment by his parents. In those cases, if the teenager does decide to come in, we agree not to work on his homosexuality, and the therapeutic alliance is founded upon some other of the client's goals, such as managing parental disapproval without family breakup, or dealing with problems of peer rejection. End quote. It's all about consent, never coercion. Another leading therapist I spoke with in 2015, Dr. David Pickup, is as scathing as Nicolosi about any talk of conversion or shaming people about their homosexuality. He writes this, Did you know that eliminating shame for having homosexual feelings is one of the very first priorities of authentic reparative therapy? Aversion techniques, behavioural-only changes, coercive attitudes, electroshock and the like are not a part of authentic therapy. Truly effective therapy is hard work. Deep emotions are experienced and wounds are healed. This can, in time, result in spontaneous and successful change, end quote. The professional association to which both the late Dr. Nicolosi and Dr. Pickup belong, is the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity. It clearly rejects any of these coercive methods and makes this statement on the right of individuals to seek professional help free of harassment by the state. Quote, the Alliance respects each client's dignity, autonomy and free agency. We believe that clients have the right to claim a gay identity or to diminish their homosexuality and develop their heterosexual potential. Tolerance and diversity means nothing if it is extended to activists, but not traditionalists, on the homosexual issue. End quote. So what merit is there in the Victorian Politburo's central claim that therapy aimed at modifying unwanted homosexual attraction is... Harmful. Now, you've got to understand, all deep psychological interventions have an expected harm rate, disturbance rate, in the range of 10%. So there are harmful anecdotes aplenty for any therapy, for depression, PTSD, child abuse, whatever you like. But anecdotes are no basis for public policy. 
We need statistically objective evidence of the relative benefits and harms of any intervention. And in the case of sexual orientation change efforts, which includes reparative therapy and other talk therapies, there is no such evidence. All advocates for a legislative ban look back to a report of the American Psychological Association, the APA, in 2009. But go read that report. Even the overtly biased APA task force who wrote this report, consisting of prominent activists in gay causes and excluding one after another any clinician who applied for membership, no matter how eminent if they were sympathetic or practiced reparative therapy. Totally stacked. Nevertheless, even this report admits that there is no clear evidence of harm. Listen to this paragraph. Studies provide no clear evidence of the prevalence of harmful outcomes among people who have undergone efforts to change their sexual orientation or the frequency of the occurrence of harm because no study to date of adequate scientific rigour has been explicitly designed to do so. Thus, says the report, we cannot conclude how likely it is that harm will occur from sexual orientation change efforts, end quote. <laughs> They're always talking about the harm that would... We well, could also say we can't conclude how little harm, how much benefit. So, the science is not settled, but that does not stop the APA recommending that this therapy should cease. They admit that we do not have objective, statistically valid evidence of harm. We don't have it. We don't. But their ill-founded prejudice is good enough for progressive governments like Victoria to act upon. That should dismay all clinicians who value dispassionate, cold, hard science and who defend a client's right to access professional care at times of distress. So at stake for the caring professions is whether we succumb to politically correct groupthink or whether we stand firm for clinical evidence and for client autonomy. The signs are not good. As Dr. Nicholas Cummings, who was the former president of the APA, the American Psychological Association, as he said, quote, the APA has chosen ideology over science and advocacy for scientific and professional concerns has been usurped by a gender-driven uh, ideologues. That concept of client autonomy is central at Dr. Nicolosi's clinic in California, seven psychologists, which reports helping hundreds of men and women minimize unwanted homosexual attraction and maximize their heterosexual potential. One of his clients from Melbourne rang me and told me he had never felt so free, that he had found a newfound sense of belonging as a man among men enjoying normal, non-sexual relationships with fellas since he started working with Dr. Nicolosi on his unwanted homosexual compulsion. Another client of Dr. Nicolosi writes this, if one thing angers me in life, it is this, when gay apologists claim that to reject a gay identity is to be in denial of my true self, my personal experience tells me the opposite. Now, this man's life story is fairly typical. It's never the same for all people, but it's fairly typical of the clients that Dr. Nicolosi sees. These are men who never felt that they belonged as a boy among boys or as a man among men and whose craving 
utterly understandable longing for that male connection and affirmation and belonging became sexualized at puberty as a way of connecting, a way of being accepted, a way of belonging among males. This client continues, quote, Therapy has helped me to connect more with men as brothers to be trusted. For most of my adult life, he says, I felt only fearful and alienated among men, especially men of my own age group. Now, when I feel masculine within, I have no emotional need to draw on the men out there who are external to me. Now, was my therapy dangerous, as some critics with an ideological axe to grind would try to claim? Well, he says, if growing in self-acceptance and feeling now that I belong among men is dangerous, I want more of it, end quote. Dr. Pickup summarizes this psychodynamic theory behind talk therapy for same-sex attraction. See if you can follow this. He says, gender identity inferiority can be a traumatic experience that is reinforced with shame-based self-beliefs for many years. For the pre-homosexual boy, and for adult men, bullying and repetitive shaming of their gender identity from primary male relationships, fathers, brothers, peers, frequently embed this soul-wrenching shame into the mind of the struggler. The client experiences emotional wounds, often repressed, that prevent the journey from boyhood into manhood being fully realized. Maleness, maleness, becomes an object to the struggler instead of something wonderful that is subjectively experienced. The result, says Dr. Pickup, in puberty, when sexual hormones kick in, masculinity is objectified and sexualized, Reparative therapy helps a client resolve these wounds, which can result in the spontaneous lessening or dissipation of homosexual feelings, end quote. One such client, Carey, had this to say about the repairing of emotional wounds, quote, when I began reparative therapy, I took on the task of growing from a wounded little boy to a whole and heterosexual man. In my relationship with my therapist, I have directly received the masculine mentoring that I needed but did not get as a child. Since I've been in therapy, my homosexual thoughts and feelings have decreased significantly, both in frequency and in intensity." End quote. These testimonies and hundreds like them look at Voicesofchange.net, voicesofchange.net, for example. These testimonies defy the claim that reorientation therapy does not work, and so does the published evidence. Clinical research is decades deep for successful sexual reorientation along a spectrum. And it shows that about a third of clients gain significant help from various psychological uh, therapies. That figure is comparable to intervention for other psychological conditions. So you can read of clients under the care of Carl Jung in 1935, Anna Freud in 1952. Dr. Bergler in 1956 reports 100 men who successfully changed under psychoanalysis which was a one-third success rate of his clients. Bieber and his team of 77 therapists in 1962 treated over 100 homosexual men and found 27% became 
exclusively heterosexual. Dozens of studies from the second half of the 20th century demonstrate the same typical one-third success rate. Of course, that implies that two-thirds experience no change or little change. But that is comparable to other forms of psychological intervention. And interestingly, in many of these studies, even those who experienced no change were still grateful for the process in many or most of the cases. As the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity, look up therapeuticchoice.com, as they put it, as is the case with all forms of psychological care, some individuals report a lack of change. While some people relapse, there are testimonies of persons who've maintained their changes for several decades. The fact that change is not always categorical and is experienced along a continuum is much the same as with any other human condition, end quote. More recently, this century, a study by Nicolosi and Bird in the journal Psychological Reports, 2000, again found a one-third level of significant change, and it noted that some of the input for these clients was from spiritual counsellors. With that in mind, think again of the anti-religious bigotry, irrational hatred, from Prem that compels Premier Andrews to blanket ban such faith-based counselling and support. The number of individual cases in history that are not captured in these formal studies is again large, but unidentified, undefined. Dr Nicholas Cummings, as I mentioned, past president of the American Psychological Association, was also chief of mental health at the huge Kaiser Permanent Clinic in San Francisco, and during his tenure, the clinic cared for some 18,000 same-sex attracted clients, of whom, he says, some 2,400 successfully changed orientation. He said this, quote, most clients on presentation did not expect, express a goal of reorientating, but came for a number of related issues and dissatisfactions concerning their homosexual lifestyle that eventually elicited a desire to change. When I say, uh, this is Nicholas Cummings, when I say that 67% had satisfactory outcomes, the majority of these were able to attain a more happy and sane homosexual lifestyle with stable relationships. This would have been a bit more than 10,000 of the 18,000 presenting, with another 2,400 actually reorienting. End quote. Chief Health Officer of the Kaiser Permanent Clinic in San Francisco. There would need to be a lot of lying by clients and a lot of fraud by clinicians for all of these findings to be untrue. An alternative explanation of the facts before us is that there are indeed individuals who benefit to varying degrees from psychological therapy that helps them understand and modify unwanted same-sex attraction and maximise their heterosexual potential. And who is Daniel Andrews or Bill Shorten to stand in their way? So, live and let live. As the former lesbian Melinda Selmus writes, gay and lesbian activists have long decried the interference of the religious right in their ability to live the sort of lives they would like. In the process, they have created an analogous situation in which psychologists are called to enforce a gay-affirming lifestyle on those who will not have it. End quote. Bob will not have it. Bob should not be told by politicians where he can or cannot seek help. He says this, before I was powerfully attracted to men sexually, but I did not like them as people. In therapy, I uncovered abuse issues. I dealt with the lingering impact of peer abuse and bullying in my past as well as my disaffection from my father and other men, now 
I love being around guys, but not. I have no desire to have sex with them. My experience, says Bob, is far from unique. Countless people can share personal experiences similar to mine. Don't listen, says Bob. Don't listen to so-called experts who are more interested in their own political agendas and winning professional accolades than they are in supporting you in what you want out of your life. End quote. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a plea to keep political agendas out of the path of such individuals, not to ban their liberty by banning safe, effective, professional therapy, all for the sake of enforcing this intolerant gay orthodoxy. Thanks.